Greetings all. Um, my name is Tamsin. I'm your moderator for this session. Um, welcome to, to everyone. Um, the session is a basic income for all, uh, dream or, or dream or delusion. So if I can just frame the subject a, a, a tiny bit, the background is that paid work is becoming a less generous, or seems to be becoming a less generous and less reliable source of income um, for many people, um, which means that a very old and, ex I think, extraordinarily radical idea has come to the fore, the notion of a go an unconditional government payment to all citizens, um, either as a, as a supplement to or a replacement for, um, paid in for, for working income. Um, so, and and it's, it's really happening. It's not just a, a theory. So Switzerland said no to it um, last year. Um, but there are plenty of other places which are beginning experiments. So um, Finland just began. Um, the Canadian province of Ontario is going to have an experiment. Cities in Scotland, um, several, I think four Dutch cities. Um, and to discuss the, the pros and cons of the idea, we have four panellists here with me who are extraordinarily well qualified to comment. Um, to my, immediately to my left is Professor Guy Standing of the University of London. Um, who is the co-president of the Basic Income Earth Network, or BIEN, which he co-founded actually in 1986, um, which gives some clue as to the, 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 the age of the idea. Um, we have Professor Michael Sandal, who's Professor of Government at um, Harvard University and author of um, What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets. We have um, Zneli Kroos, who's um, been a prominent Dutch politician, was um, EU Commissioner for Competition most recently for, um, for um, the Digital Agenda for Europe, and now sits on several um, corporate boards, including Uber and Salesforce. And we have Amitabh Kant, um, who's the CEO of the main think tank of the Indian government, Niti Ayog. And we, it's just been reported that the Indian government is looking very seriously at um, universal basic income as well. So this, in the first, um, the first 15 minutes or so, I'm just going to ask each of our panelists to offer their, all of their thoughts, really, on the question of <laughs> as, as work changes, as work is changing, is a universal basic income um, really a, a, a solution to, the, to this problem? First, um, Guy. Well, thank you very much, and uh, welcome to everybody. Thanks for coming to this session. When you've been working on a subject for 30 years and you're suddenly told you have four to five minutes to give your perspective, you feel a slight sense of awe. And I want to begin, actually, by uh, a little poem from Barbara Wooten, who said, it's from the champions of the impossible rather than the slaves of the possible that evolution draws its creative force. And I use that in our 25th anniversary because we've been going through a period where we've been doing a lot of fundamental research on the feasibility, affordability, implications of a basic income, and for many years, totally ignored. But in the last couple of years, there's suddenly been a huge surge of interest, partly by a realization about automation. Now, I want to stress that that is not my rationale for a basic income. It never has been. But it's quite useful because it's made us much more topical. <laughs> the reason I found that I've always fought for a basic income are threefold. First, it's a means of social justice. This goes back to Thomas Paine and Henry George and people who said public wealth is created over generations. And any of us know, or should know, and have the humility to know, that our income and wealth is fundamentally due to the contributions of previous generations, and much more than anything you or I do ourselves. And therefore, if you allow private inheritance, we should also have public inheritance as a social dividend on public wealth created. That means of social justice is fundamental behind why I believe in a basic income. The second reason is that it is a means to enhance republican freedom. Republican freedom is different from standard liberal forms of freedom in the sense that it means freedom from domination by figures of authority 
using their arbitrary power. It is a mechanism for enhancing republican freedom. And the third reason is that it is a means of providing people with basic security, basic security. And in that regard, we claim, uh, those of us who support basic income, it is not for eradicating poverty per se. It is for handling the issue of insecurity. I listened this morning to the very illustrious panel saying what should be done to help the squeeze middle class. I listened very, very intently. I couldn't hear a single policy that was addressed to the precariat or to the groups who are facing chronic insecurity today. Because that is behind this drift of populism. That is behind so many of the mental health problems and so on. Mental health is improved by basic security. Mental development is improved by basic security. And what we've found in our pilots, and we've done pilots, I wish people would look at the evidence rather than continue with their views, but we've done pilots covering thousands of people. And most fundamentally, we found that the emancipatory value of a basic income is greater than the money value. And I can explain that at length, but the point is that it gives people a sense of control of their time so that the values of work grow relative to the demands of labor, so that the values of learning and public participation grow rather than just surviving, so that the values of citizenship are strengthened, the values of altruism and tolerance. We found the evidence from basic income experiments that show that these are enhanced. We know as individuals and groups that at the moment society is suffering from a deprivation of those values of altruism and tolerance. So for me, I think a basic income is not a panacea, but it is part of a new distribution system that we should be building for the 21st century. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Um, another element that I would I, which I think is so fascinating is that both the left and the right are very interested in the notion of, of, a, of a basic income, and I'd love your perspective on that, Ms. Cruz. Thank you for getting the floor and after the inspirational uh, remarks uh, within four minutes, mm -hmm. um, I'm a bit back to earth and very pragmatic in the, in the sense that we first should make it clear what universal basic income we are talking for. You can mean quite a number of things on, on that issue. It can be regressive, it can be progressive and it's depending on the level for then you have to answer, and I'm what I was mentioning, a pragmatic, and I am a former politician, I'm not anymore a politician, but sometimes people say you are a politician for life, well, so be it. <laughs> um, but for me, it's always, but that's because I'm Dutch, who is paying for it, and what uh, does it mean for other benefits? For we shouldn't fill in as if nothing is done. There are social benefits. and. Well, it's one way or another. We learn that uh, you can't spend one euro several times, so to say. And uh, being an economist by training, and at that time, but that is far in the last century, so to say, um, I was reading Gilbraith, I was reading Sam Wilson, I was reading Friedman. Uh, I was later on faced with the Nixon administration mm. who did a tryout. Yeah. So uh, it's not new, ra uh, rightly said. So, so you can uh, discuss about the role of the basic income, the universal basic income. It can shrink the role of the government, but mm -hmm. it can also expand. So flexibility of the concept is why there is an interest from left and right for depending on how you fill it in, you can always find friends for one version or the other. So impossible, in my opinion, to implement at this certain moment, and I want to say at this certain moment, I'm not certain if uh, within uh, a couple of years there will be more experiments, and rightly said, there are experiments, Finland will start, uh, there are uh, in different countries, India will start, so to say. But we shouldn't forget that the radical vision, anyhow, is a high level 
replace this large part of existing welfare system. And I can assure you, also politicians, if they le are left or right, if they have to deliver first what can be cut, then the enthusiasm is less than when you are saying, shall we just find out, and, and so on. So a more modest uh, system, a hybrid system, in my opinion, set out a low level, replacing some welfare payments, and that could be done, I'm nearby certain. Mm -hmm. And then it would much blunter impact and lose many of the perceived benefits, for then we should make another defense story, so to say. Um, well, I was already mentioning Finland. Uh, California, by the way, also has a couple of experiments. Um, and basic income schemes, clear tangible cost, that's not the problem, but theoretical benefits for not yet in a way that we mm -hmm. can just compare it. So the most innovative and least ideological argument in favor are made nowadays by technical entrepreneurs mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley. And in I get it. For they are, of course, trying to defend their own future. And yes. that is quite clear what that is. No one knows, by the way, in my opinion, but perhaps I'm learning and getting food for that learning curve from uh, my colleagues. No one knows whether automation will displace jobs. Of course, you can say a number, but no one knows mm -hmm. exactly what is going to happen or produce uh, a more gradual evaluation in types of work mm -hmm. that people do. So for me, the future, quote unquote, of work may need to become a reality before a convincing political case is made. Mm -hmm. And that is fascinating. Yeah. For then, we are in a field of arguing that can make a lot of uh, explosion, so to say. Right. You need a political mainstream, no doubt about that. And for me, I was also thinking uh, Canada has a right to work. It's in, an, in a law, so to say. Human nature, by the way. So I'm a bit in between. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I also add human nature is what is for free has no value, and I'm black and white, but you get my point. That's something for, I think Michael will Michael yeah, will And for example, to. health is, is uh, important, but it is really important mm -hmm. when you are losing it. Yes. So that, that is at stake. So in my opinion, don't claim the future, but work for it, mm -hmm. and then we are. I think we should come back later on to the to yeah. sort of Silicon Valley's interest as well. Um, Mr. Kant, can you can you briefly just from the governmental perspective sort of talk us through sort of the attractions? It's, it's fascinating to have that perspective. You know, we run in India two very huge schemes. One is a rural employment guarantee scheme called the Manrega, and we run a public distribution system which has been in operation for a very long time. Both these schemes despite uh, attempts by successive governments are full of leakages, huge amount of corruption. They've been embedded with rampant corruption. Uh, one of the unique things about India today is that India has built up a huge infrastructure, one of the most revolutionary infrastructure in terms of uh, biometric. That is, every single individual in India today has Aadhaar. That is, he has a biometric. And he, has, he can either get direct payment based on either his thumb impression or on his iris. And uh, India's the only country in the world which has 110 million uh, biometric and mm -hmm. a, a billion mobile phones today. So you are heading for very revolutionary changes in India. But uh, the world of manufacturing is undergoing very revolutionary changes. And uh, the changes are that you will move from uh, low skill, low pay, it's not that there won't be jobs, there will be jobs, but you'll move from low skill, low pay to high skill and high pay. And that would require radical restructuring of your education system. That would require a major restructuring of your skill uh, movement today. And uh, it's not that there are no jobs, there will be jobs, but there are not the right kind of people available for those jobs at the moment. So there's, there's a huge imbalance which is taking place. The technology evolution has moved much faster than the structuring and the skill evolution. And therefore, my belief is 
that if you were to do away with, with the rural employment guarantee scheme, which is plagued with uh, vast leakages and the public distribution system, and we, when you couple that with a very, very uh, radical disruption which has taken place in the Indian system right now through the process of demonetization, what it has given to the government is that the Indian economy was highly informal economy. I mean, you had a $2 trillion economy, a formal economy, and you had almost uh, a trillion dollar informal economy, a black economy, and that black economy has been smashed and merged into the formal economy. So uh, government has actually made all the black money, uh, made it absolutely white money now, and you, are, you ended up with huge resources with the government. They've all reached uh, the government bank accounts, and therefore you are going to end up with vast amount of taxes and with vast amounts of penalties which will be levied over the next two to three years. And the government's coffers will be quite rich in terms of uh, this. So my basic assumption is that if you were to look at doing away with the rural employment guarantee scheme, which are inefficient, and the public distribution system, and my belief is that uh, it's much better to pay directly straight into the individual account rather than going through any middleman. And you've been able to create a vast unique infrastructure which doesn't exist in any other part of the world, you'll be able to reach directly to the beneficiary. However, having said that, I'm a great believer in not giving money as grant. You create parasites if you give money as grants. And I'm a, I worked very extensively in uh, rural development and in, with traditional fishermen in the state of Kerala in India. And one of the unique things about Kerala was its self-help group movement. And, uh, particularly several self-help groups which were led by women entrepreneurs. And they've been some of the most remarkable success stories of generating income through productive activities. And therefore, uh, my view is that you should provide universal basic income, but give it as a loan with interest-free for a period of three years, but ensure that this money is repaid and is then used to recycle for productive purposes. And that will enable you to reach vast number of more people in the society. Great. Is that income? Well, uh, it's, 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 you, it's, it's an income. Yeah. It's coming into the hands of the person. It's reaching the person directly. But if you are giving it as, as a, you're giving it essentially as an interest-free loan for yeah. a sub certain yeah. period of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Professor Sandal, I know that you're, you're fascinated by, among other things, the role of work and the importance of, of, of paid work in mm -hmm. people's lives, if, if, if you'd like to comment on yes, we whichever tend, aspects. Well, we tend to think of work primarily as a source of income, as a way of making a living. Mm -hmm. But of course, work is also a source of meaning and identity mm -hmm. and a place in the world, a way of contributing to the common good. And the debate about the basic income uh, puts in sharp relief and forces us to confront and, and debate mm -hmm. what really is the point and the purpose and the social meaning of work. Mm -hmm. Listening to my colleagues on the panel, it strikes me there are two very different arguments um, in the current debate about a universal basic income. There's the ethical argument, going back to Thomas Paine and that Guy summarized very well, and then there's the compensatory argument, the Silicon Valley uh, argument based on automation. Now, one might uh, look at the current debate, notice these two strands of argument, and conclude that, well, they both point in the same direction. So it doesn't matter too much, really, which one we embrace. I think that would be a mistake. I think that it matters a lot what reasons, what rationale, what principle governs the, uh, the embrace of a universal basic income for the following reason. There are two principles um, that I think are important to preserve and honor in how a society relates uh, work to rewards that are distributed. One principle that I think is important, we often lose sight of, is that we are not morally entitled to the full fruits of the exercise of our talents in a market society for all of the reasons that Guy summarized, that Thomas Paine emphasized. It's the indebtedness argument. We are mutually indebted for the success and the rewards our talents bring. And 
uh, that's, so one principle that's important to affirm and remind ourselves uh, is that one, that we're mutually indebted for whatever success we enjoy or for whatever troubles we encounter. It's not all our own doing. That's one principle. The other principle is, uh, partly in virtue of that, we have an obligation, everyone, to contribute to the common good, typically through work uh, and in whatever other ways. Now, if... The advantage of the ethical argument is that it emphasizes the mutual indebtedness. And it doesn't suggest that the money is instead of working. It preserves the idea that whether or not one receives a basic income, it's not a warrant to, to be idle, to mm -hmm. fail to contribute to the common good. But the compensatory Silicon Valley automation argument does not have this feature. If that were the primary rationale for adopting a universal basic income, the message that it would send, the social meaning that it would promote would be, here is a side payment, uh, uh, a way of easing the way uh, into a world without work, or a world in which work is obsolete for a great many people, which is another way of saying, here's a, we're going to pay you off in exchange for accepting a world in which your contribution to the common good isn't really required. And what you do with your time, that's your business. I think that would be corrosive of uh, the, the sense of mutual obligation, as well as the sense that we are mutually indebted uh, for whatever success we enjoy. Thank you very much. That's fascinating. Ms. Ms. Cruz, can I ask you just to comment a little bit on Silicon Valley's interest and the sort of the, the force of the automation argument? I mean, do you, do you think that's really something that's driving the interest in a basic income at the moment? Well, it's broader than Silicon Valley. Yeah. It is the robotizing. Right. Uh, yeah, it, sorry. It, it, yeah, no, but I was mentioning, from... so I don't blame yeah. you. I blame myself. But just to put it in a broader context, we are nearby certain that certain of our tasks can be done on Earth, can be done by robots. Right. And we should be pleased, for in most cases, yeah. that is not a lot of fun. Sometimes it's fun, right. but it's not. So then the main issue of a human being being active in yeah. a society is at stake. And that right. means that the communication is extremely important. Yeah. But what I'm fearing, and I'm, I'm really yeah, grateful for the sharp analysis of my colleagues. I, I fear that in politics, and again, I have been a politician for, for a long, long time, that it is just not pure and transparent in the argument. So mm -hmm. it depends, are you left, right, and what is. Right. So mm -hmm. I want this discussion um, in, in general terms very clear and transparent. It's not a matter of that you can stop robotizing, yeah. and we shouldn't. And by an aging population, by the way, there are a lot of positive effects. So anyhow, it's difficult for a global scene talking about this right. principle, for them you need to be far more specific. But it's not that it is only automatization, mm -hmm. and therefore people have to move to the site. Um, it is a it can be a very constructive hmm. mm -hmm. consequence that you can get rid of certain issues. And by the way, it's more fun talking about, for example, the medical world. Hmm. It's far more fun when you can specify on the specific hmm. issues that are at stake and not those issues that we have to do, but that can be done by mm -hmm. a robot or that can mm -hmm. be done. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the other, the other very large topic, of course, is, is how you is how you fund this. Um, I mean, if you if you do some basic calculations, you you end up for for America, for instance. I think if you scrap a lot of existing welfare programs, you'd still have to and, and use those to, to fund a basic income. You'd still have to dramatically expand the the share of tax as a proportion of GDP, mm. and you still only get around ten thousand dollars a year. And the other issue, of course, is that um, you know, billionaires would also be receiving the, the universal basic income. So there are a lot of contradictions around, you know, just I mean, the difficulty of funding it and and the sort of you know some inequity in, in who's getting it. Um, Guy, you're well practiced in, in speaking about the affordability and, and how you fund it. I'd love to hear some 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 of those ideas. 
I think the, I've got to be blunt, the affordability question is a very easy one mm -hmm. to answer. Mm -hmm. And I mean it. Just written a book where I've gone through the various ways of paying for a basic income. Somehow, with quantitative easing, the government, the US government, managed to fund quantitative easing of 475 uh, trillion dollars. If that money had been used to pay a basic income, every American household could have received $56,000. Okay, that's just one little example. But what I believe, what please may I continue, please may, you, you, you can come back to me afterwards. But I strongly believe that we must frame basic income as paid from rentier capitalism and from rentierism. Because at the moment, the corruption of capitalism about which I've written is primarily because the returns to property and intellectual property and the rentier income from natural resources are going to a tiny minority. And we need to be sharing that. So something like the Alaska Permanent Fund mm -hmm. or the Norwegian Fund which was set up and now means that every Norwegian is technically a crone millionaire. Had Britain set up the same fund, they could be paying out more than a basic income now. So what we are arguing for is you build up a fund, a sovereign wealth fund system, by levying on rental income, and intellectual property and so on, and couch the debate as saying you're redistributing income as a system and not taxing the, the worker to pay a lazy person. Mm. That mustn't be seen. And what I want to say as regarded to Michael's point is that my own entry to this whole debate was precisely the need to reconceptualize what we mean by work. Mm -hmm. I believe this technological revolution that we're undergoing is actually creating more work. Mm -hmm. The only problem is that it's not being remunerated. Mm -hmm. It's contributing to growing inequality. And the reason why Silicon Valley types are up worried is that they think all the income is going to be the owners of the robots mm -hmm. and the people who were, were workers are going to be without any income. I've been asked across to California to talk about this and I'm advising on the California pilot which is taking place. And the last point I would like to make, and apologies for taking too much time, is in response to the Indian case. When we were launching our pilots in Madhya Pradesh and West Delhi, where we were giving everybody a basic income, every man, every woman, every child, paid through the mother, I remember Sonia Gandhi saying to us, what a stupid idea, what a waste. They will spend it on alcohol and tobacco. And uh, at the end of the pilot, she asked to see us again, and she said, I wish I'd known. Because people had used the basic income to improve their nutrition, family health, schooling, schooling performance. The entre petty entrepreneurship had, had flourished in the villages. And if anyone is interested, they could either buy my book or, or, or see a video on the results. And the consequence was that they were generating more income. They were lowering public service costs because they were healthier, etc. And I would be very wary of turning it into a loan. A loan rewards the entrepreneurial and would increase the inequalities in those villages. Whereas everybody having a basic income, there was a lot of pooling to help each other out. There was a lot of cooperative activity that took place. And it didn't sought out the potential winners from the losers. It increased community solidarity. And I'm delighted that the Indian government, as, as you know, is currently con considering it. And I've had a lot of interaction with it. And they're going to come out with this fantastic report, which is fundamentally important because a major government, for the first time, is going to be putting it up and say, let's discuss. And I think that's a, a big step forward. 
Um, in, in a few minutes, I'd like to open this up to the audience and, and just take some questions. But just, just very briefly, Mr. Kant, if you would just give us some perspective um, on you know, how India sees the affordability. I mean, you, you, you made it seem as if it's no problem at all because of this windfall of tax, which is fascinating. But how does that work on a, on a sort of a, you know, a year-on-year -year basis going forward? You know, there are huge uh, inequalities in the Indian system right now. And uh, if you were to look at uh, the vast array of schemes which India provides for people below the poverty line, uh, despite implementing them, you find that almost 33% of the children are stunted because of lack of good nutrition. Uh, you find that a class five student is not able to read his mother tongue, uh, class two. And once uh, you're not able to do that reformation, then he always throughout his life remains yeah. behind. And that of actually one third of the population is actually getting back into the below the poverty line simply because they are not able to take care. Uh, there is a very heavy expenditure on tertiary care today. So we've done this initial exercise across that if you were to do away with the rural employment guarantee scheme, uh, which has been a, a, a very uh, which has been a scheme under implementation across governments for quite some time, but it is several studies across the government. Independent studies have shown that the vast, there are vast leakages and there's a huge amount of corruption attached with it. And so with the public distribution system. And if you were to look at uh, the resources which would emerge as a consequence of this de de demonetization process to the government, and you were to target, because India is very different. India is not like Netherlands or not like, uh, it's, it's bigger than 24 countries of Europe plus another 30,000 people. So it's the vast population must be taken into recognition. So you look at basic universal income for people below the poverty line. And if you were to do that for all people below the poverty line, you'd be able to provide and then, yeah. close to about 1,000 rupees yeah. per month for them. And that is a fairly good amount of money to go directly into the bank account of the women head of that family individually, women individually into that person. And therefore, you are simultaneously, I mean, this uh, entire process is still under evolution. I mean, it's still under discussion. But uh, 1,000 rupees per person below the poverty line uh, would be a substantial amount of money uh, to provide good purchasing power. And I think uh, if India's ambition, India is growing at about 7.6% per annum. Uh, it's uh, an oasis of growth, but its ambition and its hunger is to grow at even higher rates of 9 to 10% for the next three decades or more. Mm -hmm. And uh, you are confronted with a global scenario which is extremely unfavorable with protectionism and Brexit happening. And you have to create demand on the back of your domestic economy. Mm -hmm. So you have to spurt rural demand in India. And that is one of the key challenges for India, how to drive growth at higher levels and create jobs simultaneously back on the back of domestic consumption. Thank you. And that will, that will give much. it a push. Okay. So if we could have some questions from the audience, please. I think there should be a microphone around somewhere. Um, the gentleman in the front row, please. My name is Elias Selman. I am the publisher of an economic business and politics outlet in Latin America. In Latin America, during the last 15 years, uh, we've been uh, doing a public policy called Transparentes Condicional, which means that this money that is transferred to the poor people, but the poor people has to comply with some stuff like vaccinate their children, send them to school, etc. Uh, <clears throat> two questions. First of all, I could say that it happened in Italy, which is the populism take in some way kidnap that benefit and they got the government take all the credit and then they reproduce the same uh, uh, party or the same power uh, in, in for the next and next election. This one question is how do you say that? Because I think Transferential conditional is very similar to basic income. Second, 
we enjoy in Latin America like 12 years of economic boom because of the commodity price. As you know, this is changing very mm -hmm. rapidly. And mm -hmm. today, the yeah. program has no been uh, put in jeopardy for the economic situation. And this my second question is, yeah, I don't I so much to say now that how you can choose that yeah. in countries like Latin America. Maybe India is a good example, but this is my second question. Would you like to take that? Uh, yeah, let, let me just respond very briefly. Obviously, I have to be. The Bolsa Familia program in uh, Brazil, I first remember going there in the, 90s, in the 1990s and advocating basic income. We have a strong basic income network in Brazil, as you probably know. And um, the Bolsa Familia was introduced with the conditionality that people had to send their children to school and to, to have medical checkups. And I remember talking with a minister, good friend who joined Vien, uh, and I said, look, this is unfair on the poor woman who's in a favela who hasn't got control of her children, she's desperate, she's you know, stressed out, and little Johnny doesn't go to school for 85% of the time, that was the formal rule. Are you gonna penalize her and the family as a result of that? And he looked at me and said, Guy, we try not to impose the conditionality. <laughs> because he got the conditionality to satisfy the middle class, that it was being done. Now, both you are quite correct. Recent developments have, have tended to turn it away. But while it was operating at its best, the Bolsa Familia, what happened was the Gini coefficient of income inequality fell dramatically, more so than at any other time in Brazilian history. The poverty rate also declined, and women's poverty relative to men's went down much more. So it was quite a useful lesson. I'm against conditionality, and against the World Bank's support for conditional cash transfers, where you, you impose behavioral conditions on the poor that you don't impose on other groups in society. That's fundamentally against my ethical principles. And, and I think that the the lessons of the CCTs are now coming out that by accident, some of them have gone unconditional cash transfers, and they've performed just as well. And, and I think that's a, that is one positive lesson that's come out. Thank you. Um, the lady in the front row, please. Thank you very much. Let, let me just say, in terms of affordability, that conditional cash transfers in Latin America are less than 1% yeah. of GDP. So they have gone a long way with a very small cost because there are things that we are doing that are much more expensive than 1% of GDP. The only country where they are more than 1% of GDP is Brazil, that it has gone almost to three. But still, it's a very affordable program. So I think that the problem is not there. The problem is how you get conditional cash transfers, conditional or unconditional, we can discuss, okay? With uh, how you get it to everybody that is equal. Because the problem of uh, uh, clientelism comes when you choose the group that is poor but is your poor. <laughs> if you go to all those that are equal, so it's a right, it's not a given by a party or by a leader. And that will be the way not to go into clientelism and really go for the right agenda mm. in terms of basic income. Yeah. So there, the Indians uh, uh, saying and putting it directly into the bank account, mm. that would address yeah. this problem. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Is being done yeah. Women's yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Two birds with one stone. Thank you. Um, gentleman at back, please, please. Uh, thank you. My name is Alex Forrester. I run a nonprofit in the United States that works with entrepreneurs in low-income communities. So I'm very sensitive to what Professor Standing said about uh, insecurity and the corrosive role that that plays, but also what Professor Sandel said about the power of purpose and productivity and creativity. Um, so I'm curious why we are talking about uh, UBI uh, as a standalone uh, issue and not in the context of uh, a larger uh, a connection between either EITC and a, a national public service or more of a privately uh, organized um, 
uh, 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 marketplace using uh, something like time banking or, or otherwise? Is there a way to connect universal basic income in a larger context like that? Mm -hmm. Guy, one for you, I think. Um, I'm glad you've raised EITC. EITC, for those not familiar, is Earned Income Tax Credit that works in the United States. I, I think you could claim, and we're having to be rhetorical because of uh, time, uh, is one of the biggest boondoggles in welfare history. <laughs> Billions are spent in tax credits, which are effectively a subsidy to capital, that are actually helping to keep down wages. The research is quite strong in this regard, and it encourages inefficiency and all sorts of things. But just think what you could do with those billions and billions of dollars that are being spent in the earned income tax credits. And it's the same in all forms of tax credits. My own country spends billions of pounds on tax credits which have precisely the same effect and they could be part of the resources for helping to build up for the fund to pay for a basic income. And on that thing, I just want to take one point which I didn't go into last time, which is that the biggest potential source now globally is to roll back fossil fuel subsidies. Now, the Indian case, the fossil fuel subsidies come to about 5 6% of GDP. If you took those fossil fuel subsidies, which cause all sorts of negative externalities, away and put them into the fund for a basic income, you wouldn't get to 1,000, you would get to 500 rupees for every individual Indian. And then you could impose a fossil fuel tax because of the emissions and so on that, that, that are caused. So you've got potential sources of funding in various ways. And I think that in the Indian case, that is really an important source. I do wish that we had about twice the amount of time or even three times. I'm afraid um, we're, that's all the questions that we can take for the time being. Um, so what I'd like to do now is just go through each of our panelists and just um, ask what has been the single most important insight, and if you could keep your comments really to a very, very brief um, word. I'm starting with Mr. Mr. Kant. Uh, you know, India is a highly unequal society, and the extent of uh, formalization of the Indian tax structure is very minimal, and uh, therefore uh, you are creating too many. Uh, wealthy people who are not paying taxes at all. And therefore, uh, to my mind, a government which has been politically elected to provide equity and to create jobs will find it in a, in a historical moment when you're finding it very difficult to create jobs. Mm -hmm. It is not able to ensure okay. that the economy is able to grow and you are able to create adequate demands, will find it very difficult politically to survive. And you'll, you are heading for very radical mm -hmm. uh, social movements on ground, simply because of lack of your ability to create jobs. And therefore, I'm quite convinced as a civil servant that it's incumbent upon the government to provide a universal basic income uh, of some form to people below the poverty line. And that is doable if you are able to ch a cannibalize and end all inefficient government schemes which are presently being run in the name of raising incomes of the poor. Mm -hmm. So you do away with them and then go in for a universal basic income for people below the poverty line, number one. Number two, I made this point, and I'm, I've, since I've worked very closely with self-help groups uh, across India, and I find that once you create that entrepreneurial spirit, particularly in self-help groups of women-led movements. They've been extremely su successful across Tamil Nadu, across Andhra Pradesh, across. And since this is, uh, we are at the initial stages of this, you need to create a movement where this f funding is utilized for some productive purposes. Mm -hmm. Ms. Crows, again, if, if you could reflect on the discussion today and so far, what, what, what has been an important insight from some of the other panelists? comments. For, for, for me, it's even clearer after listening to the audience, mm -hmm. but also to my colleagues, that we need to be far more precise uh, to have a decent discussion. For it, the situation in India is completely different, Latin America is completely different compared to, for example, Western Europe. Having said that, and I mentioned up front that I'm not a strong believer from one side or another, for I want to know 
what is your model and what does it cost? Just to, to make it clear again, in the UK, and I don't take my, my own country, but in the UK, when you are going for this system, and when you are um, aware that um, 35 hours working per week, uh, 7.20 pounds uh, per hour minimum wage, when you are counting with 52 million uh, over 18, so not for everyone, mm. so not for the kid, then still you need to take into account that 680 billion pounds is involved in this system. So I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I'm saying you need to fund 680 billion. Having said that, that is a third of the UK GDP. And so far, just facts and nothing more. And what for me is the risky side of this type of discussions when we are not decent in what market are we talking of and what, till what account are we for, I'm a great believer in your uh, proposal for women and giving them a loan and how the, the, the min, minimum credit and so on for that stimulating. I'm a strong believer in linking it to another great case, education, health and so on. But having said that, it, it is anyhow, as far as I'm aware in Western Europe, it's a matter if you are proposing this that you have to skip other social welfare issues. And you can make a clear story for me that the social welfare system is not fair in, uh, in certain countries mm -hmm. of Western Europe. So be it. But then we need to be in the political arena willing and able to take that type of dis discussions and decisions. For mm -hmm. otherwise, we are making nice proposals and we are not talking about who is paying the bill and what are the consequences of this paying the bill. He's and a that. fund in Norway, well, they were lucky that they were on gas um, and, uh, and uh, that they were wise politicians at that time to make a fund out of it. Mm -hmm. Professor Sandel, what has struck you most from, from the discussion? Well, I was struck by the uh, point was raised about con conditional cash transfers in Latin America. Guy said he didn't like conditionality because why should it's unfair to impose conditions on the poor that are not imposed on other citizens. That made me wonder, well, maybe we should impose some yeah. requirements on all <laughs> citizens. Ah, and then, and yeah. then, mm. and then I heard the contribution from the back of the room who, uh, the point about, what about national service of some kind? So here's a suggestion, a universal basic income coupled with a kind of conditionality that applies to all citizens, rich and poor alike, maybe to include some form of national service, maybe to include a requirement of voting in elections, as well as sending your kids to school. <laughs> Yeah. It's a way of bringing together the two principles yeah. with yeah. which I, I suggested we begin, sense of mutual indebtedness connected to a sense that uh, everyone has an obligation to contribute to the common good. Thank you. Yeah. Guy, would you like to offer what, what struck you most? Well, just responding to Michael's point, I've actually, Article 29 of my precariat, precariat charter is for deliberative democracy to be supported by a basic income. So to require people to attend at least one political meeting a year and to vote in general elections. But that must be a moral obligation. It, once you make it into a legal obligation, it brings the questions, what sort of punishment do you impose and what all sorts of other problems. But it, it is an interesting area. What I wanted to conclude by is saying, the big elephant in the room that hasn't snorted, I think is the word, which we usually get in discussions, is the implications for work. Now, the, cla the classic objection by uh, Christian Democrats and Liberal Democrats at the political center is if you gave people a basic income, they would sit stop down. work, sit down. Yet if you ask opinion polls, 99% of people say, when they're asked, if you had a basic income, would you stop work or reduce your work? They will say no, right? And the fact is that we have found in our pilots, in India, in Africa, in, in Canada, we're finding it in other experiments, people who have a basic income increase the amount of work, not reduce it. 
Part of the reason is you remove the poverty trap, and that's why I disagree with your poverty line approach, mm. because you have a poverty trap. Mm. Anybody who's below the poverty line in India, which is a crazy system, you would face a marginal tax rate of 90%, because you'd lose the benefits as you got income. In the Netherlands, it's over 80%. So the precariat, the people in the poverty trap situation, if they go from a benefit at the moment, a means-tested benefit, into a low-wage job, they're facing a marginal tax rate of 80%, 90%. Now, how many people would turn out to work if you faced a marginal tax rate of that level? The, the, the middle classes would revolt. But that's what you require in your existing systems. Existing systems. So you would actually increase the incentive to work because you'd remove the poverty trap. You wouldn't lose your basic income if you started earning income from a job. I think that's very important. And final point is that it would help us in the emancipatory project of reconceptualizing what we mean by work in the 21st century. Because work isn't just labor for a boss. It's also for caring for our relatives, our family, our community. It's all the sort of work that we need to do to prepare ourselves for living. It includes part of education, which is liberating us as citizens. And for me, the great virtue of having a basic income, which we found in our experiments and also psychologists have found, is it increases people to do work that is not labor. Mm -hmm. But don't tell me the work of caring for my elderly mother or father is not productive. Mm -hmm. I have short Anglo-Saxon words for that. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't use it, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Um, on, on that note, I'm afraid we're going to have to bring the session to an end. If I can briefly um, just share yeah, some good. of the main Thank points you. I thought was so fascinating. Where, I mean, firstly, the idea book? that, uh, you know, since both the... Sorry, hang, hang on a second. Sorry. So the fact that both the left and the right um, are supporters, I think, means no quick agreement on actually how you implement it. The fact that the ethical justification is the best one, not the compensatory one. And that funding is, is still a hugely open question, who pays the bill? Um, and with that, just thank you, to the, thank you to the audience for the questions and for your participation. And thank you so much to our, to our panelists. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.